We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight's question comes from one of our awesome Patreon patrons, Windsor Area game designer, Roger Malosh, better known as Roger Dodger, who wrote in with this detailed series of questions about game teaching. Roger writes, hey, Mo and Sean. I once did a playtest where I displayed a QR code on my phone with a link to the rules for my game. Everyone scanned it and read the rules on their phones. After a few minutes, I answered a few questions and clarified a rule or two. We then all started playing the game and it went like clockwork. Wouldn't it be great if it always happened this way? <laughs> Generally, however, the responsibility of deciphering and explaining the rules falls on one person in the group. This person is the teacher and is quite often the scapegoat when things go wrong. Mm -hmm. How many times have you been accused of leaving out a rule when you know that a player simply forgot it or wasn't listening? Or, after explaining a very complex game and seeing the player's eyes glaze over, you might decide to leave some of the finer details out until a better time arises to explain them. You then get flack from the players for hiding important information. It seems that you just can't win when you are the rules person. It should be the group's responsibility to understand the game, not just one person. Mm -hmm. Maybe players can take turns explaining the game so that everyone can see just how hard it is. Maybe the game can be split up into pieces where each person learns and explains a certain part of the game. What are your thoughts on this? One last question. Why is there just one set of rules in a game which has multiple players? All right, first off, thank you for the question, Roger, Roger Dodger. Um, these are the kind of questions I love getting. I like these nice, detailed, long questions with like background info, right? It starts off with some background and sets up a situation that Roger has run into, uh, run into and caused a problem for him, right? He has his own game night problem. He kind of goes on to explain what it is. He then gives more detail and he includes some insight and then finishes it off with some de definite questions for us to answer. These are the kind of questions I actually expected to get when we first started the show. And I was like, we're going to be a Dear Abby from Gamers. I actually thought we'd get more of the, hey, Mo and Sean, the other day I was running my game night and this happened. Which I'm not really complaining that that's not what we got, but I do like it when we do get this. And don't forget, if you've got questions like this, mo at tabletopbellhop.com mm -hmm. or go right to the website and hit Ask the Bellhop. So there's quite a lot to unpack in Roger's question here, but overall, the gist of his question is basically that it can be not fun. It can be terrible to be the rule teacher. And there's a lot of pressure put on the rule teacher. And should it be there or should it not? It basically, Roger's kind of like, you're, you're, you're giving me the weight of the world here. I'm, I'm in charge of way too much stuff. I have way too much responsibility. And why can't we share this wealth? Why is it always down to one person to do this? The thing is, sometimes, yeah, it's a lot of work, but it can also be very rewarding. So there is, it's just like being a dungeon master in a role-playing game. Yes, you have more responsibilities. Yes, you have more work. Yes, you have to prepare the adventure and there's more going on in the background. But then when it all comes together and it works, I don't think there's anything more rewarding when playing a role-playing game than being a GM of a successful campaign. doesn't matter how much you pull off as a player, you're not going to get that feel as a successful DM does. Well, I get the exact same thing when teaching a game to someone when they I see it click. And then again, when they finish the game, like, oh, that was a lot of fun. Or even more so, they decide to go get it. Like, oh, that's awesome. I now have to go get this game or I have to share this with my friends. Or if I'm teaching it at a store, having someone get up, go over and buy a copy of the game. That is such a fantastic feeling that yes, while there is some burden to teaching, I do personally at least think the rewards are worth it. Now it's going to be up to you to make that call if it is or isn't. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. There's a whole lot of of sort of, push and take and a lot of it is going to depend on your personality yeah. and who you are whether or not you want to a deal with the teaching but also deal with the rewards that can come yeah. from teaching so let's break down roger's question into specific topics because he's got a lot of stuff in there so overall he's like teaching stinks it's not worth it or or, or sometimes i feel it's unfair 
So let's start off with the first thing he said, just his background info on using QR codes and his specific comment of, wouldn't it be great if it always happened this way? And well, yeah, I wish. Like if, if every time you sat down and played a game, it just went smoothly and it just worked and you all played and no one got upset at anyone for missing rules or everything, that would be great. That's the ideal. So I don't think needing QR codes is necessarily the way to do it. But if it worked for you, all the power to you. And I do um, greatly respect the use of modern technology for that. Years ago, I couldn't point people to a Rado runs through or a Rodney Smith watch it played. The fact those even now exist is fantastic. And even having a QR code to a PDF on a Google Drive is something we couldn't have done years ago. I would have had to photocopy copies of the rules and bring them out to everyone. And I got to say, like, yes, it is awesome when it worked that works out and happens that way for the first time. And this is an interesting one, because personally, I would much rather have the rule book in my hands mm -hmm. than a video or a PDF for a first learner of the rules. But then I'm also I'm aware that I'm an old guy and I yeah. get that my preferences may not be the main anymore. And this is something we covered, I think, way back on like episode two of our podcast, where we talked about how players learn games. And everyone learns differently. And there are different ways you learn games. And I'll reiterate some of this. We'll throw a link to the actual podcast. I probably should have looked up which one it was. One of our early ones. We sound terrible, but the advice is good. <laughs> Plus, uh, there's an article on the blog. You can read it. That reads probably better than we sound. But what we're looking at is people learn by reading, sitting and reading the rules, by watching, watching someone do the rules, by listening, which is hearing someone read the rules out to you. And honestly, that is the smallest percentage of people. There are very few people that learn well, having the re rules read to them. And most importantly is doing. The best way to actually learn a game and to teach a game is to get the players to play the game. Whether that's a matter of just starting the game as quick as possible, or the matter of getting them to touch and do the things while you're explaining it. So just little simple things like if they say it's a worker placement game, if you place your cube here, you do this, we'll have the player put their cube there and then do whatever that is, right? So that is really important. And I think that's way more important than necessary. Like being able to provide multiple ways for people to learn is the important part. So the QR code could be great with the right group of players. Watching a watch it play group could be great with the right group of players. Giving everyone a PDF of the rules before the game is going to be great for players like Sean. Yeah, and it's interesting. And one of the problems you run into is uh, sort of the complexity of the game because Rotto might take, you know, 20 to 25 minutes to explain most games. Mm -hmm. Whereas some games you might take a half hour to explain to a group or you might take 15 or 10 minutes to explain to yeah. a group. Uh, and so the even if they learn better with uh, the video, you may be taking a whole lot more time to deal with that video. Yes. Yeah, and some of the videos are not quick. If you, if you can't stand watching things at two times speed, you're looking at like a half hour commitment or more. Yeah. If for most watch it played videos or how to play videos. And even then, they don't tend to teach everything. Uh, Rodney's most famous term, I'll leave that for you to discover on your own, can be an issue if everyone's expecting to learn to play right from that video. Really, a lot of this should be done ahead of time which that is something we are not going to get into this episode because we have covered on the past is how to teach games well. We're not going to get into that here, but one of my main suggestions is this is work that should be done ahead of time. Absolutely. Now, the thing is, as Roger points out, in general, just for whatever reason, because it's always been this way, the responsibility of deciphering and explaining the rules falls on one person in the group. Now, for some reason, and it kind of makes sense to me in a way, this defaults to the person who owns the game. And to me, that makes sense because you are the person who owns it. So you have the rules and you're probably the one that's asking everyone else to come play. So you're the one trying to organize things and get things going. And the onus is on you to now provide a good experience with that game. So it's on you to teach it. Now, I'm not saying this is right or wrong. This is in general how things are now. And this person who is the teacher is quite often the scapegoat when things go wrong. Now, I don't know. I like it just it's always been that way. I, I can't think of a good justification for it, except for the fact that like, well, it's your game. I, the same thing goes with DMs again. I, I guess I'm going to talk a lot about role playing games tonight, but the, the, the teacher of the game and the GM in a role playing game have very similar roles, responsibilities. 
And it's been for years, the DM's responsibility to schedule the game, to get the players together, to provide the snacks, to provide the players, to track the treasure, to track the NPCs, to write the adventure. And there's no reason it has to be that way, except that some early GMs were power freaks and control freaks that wanted to do all that. And now the game has finally evolved to a point where people are realizing like, hey, you know what? It's your character. You read all the rules for that. I don't need to know every rule in the game. I just kind of need to know how to run the monsters. And you know what? Yeah, I'm going to run the game, but you guys are going to have the fun. So how about you figure out the schedule and I'll just show up because I don't need that added stress. And like that's becoming more of a thing. And I would love to see that more on the board gaming side as well. In general, people show up to play games and people show up to show off games. And they tend to be two different groups of people. And well, if you want to show off the game, you generally have to be the one to teach it. And I very much know the feeling of, well, it's your game. Like, teach us. I'm here. Entertain me. Here yeah. I am now. Entertain us. Yeah. So if it naturally falls to the person who's best at it to teach, yes. great. But it often, as we've just finished saying, falls to whoever owns the game. And that person may not be the best person to teach the game. Uh, and the same for GMing, you know, again, oh, you bought the books? Great, run us an adventure. Um, now, interestingly, uh, while generally Mo is the teacher for various reasons, not the least of which because he owns all the games, uh, <laughs> but uh, not too long ago, I'm the one who taught us Draconis. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was simply because Mo was up sharing sales and I went downstairs to the game room and opened up the box and sorted all the cards and read through the rules so i was prepared to teach it and we had the time with the game to be able to prep mm -hmm. to teach it uh whereas again normally if you are the owner of the game you're the person who has that time with the product yes to teach and that's one of the big things is teaching a game by just reading the uh by just reading the pdf or just watching the video is problematic having the actual physical game in front of you and again me this might just be me but for me it makes a huge difference as to whether or not mm -hmm. i can prop learn it well enough to teach it or maybe just learn it well enough to struggle through on bga until i've played it a couple of times yeah yeah bga we said it before not a good way to learn a game no. or teach it's terrible same with tabletopia i assume um and tabletop simulator you don't really want to teach games there it can't be done yeah but it's rough now the thing is it doesn't have to be this way now, in all the years of playing game, I've only seen this relationship once where a person with the budget buys games, puts the shipping address of the rule teacher in the, the checkout order online. They tend to buy from Cool Stuff Inc. because uh, they have credit from selling a ton of magic cards there. Uh, and then the game shows up at the game teacher's house who then does all the unboxing and reading the rules. And then the person who bought the game shows up on Saturday and is like, show me my new game. And it works fantastic. That group has a dynamic that that works so well and so awesome that, that I almost envy it, except I'm, I don't mind teaching games. Like if I hated teaching games, it would be awesome. Uh, but it would be so awesome now and then to just like hear someone. I, I admit, this is one of the things I miss about public play is not having to teach, being able to show up and have someone else present to me the, like I get to sit back and go, come on, entertain me. Show me, show me the fun. Show me the fun. Come on. And I do miss it. And so there's no reason it has to be that way, but there are reasons that it has developed that way. For one, too, is the person buying the game is usually the one excited about the game that wants to play it. And the players are usually like, sure, show me a new game. Like, yeah. like most of my friends are that way. Like my friends aren't like the people we game with aren't like, oh, show me Star Trek. That looks awesome. They're just like, all right, what do you have to show us tonight? We're willing to play anything. So it's more about me showing off the game. So, of course, it's my job to do the work to present the game. Or find someone who can. Absolutely. And again, it so much depends on that dy dynamic, both as a person, but also as a group. Uh, there are times mm. when, yeah, I would love to get down. And if, you know, if Mo's up there sharing sales, I will absolutely crack open the box, pull out the rule book, start pushing, you know, pushing some uh, components around so that I can learn it myself. Mm. And then Mo doesn't have, no one has to teach because... Mo knows the game already, or maybe Mo has to refresh it, or I can help yeah. Mo refresh his understanding of the game, and then we just jump in and play, uh, which can be a great way to do it. But again, that's a time investment mm -hmm. that has to be made. Now, we also did talk about, this is much more recently, getting games to the table right away. 
So you bought the game, put it to the table. How do you learn it quickly? That's where we get into some of the stuff Roger talked about with different people sharing the responsibility. And we didn't get into some ideas for that, but I was thinking about it. And I think another thing with Roger is Roger is new to hobby board gaming. He's new to these more complex where you actually do need to prep ahead of time and prepare and learn to teach. Unlike you sit down and you teach the basic moves and you go like in most abstract games, right? You just sit down and kind of play and figure it out because there aren't that many options. Well, the thing is all of Roger's gaming experience is basically public play. And again, public play, you have two groups. You have people who are excited about a game that want to show it off, and you have people who are just there to play games. And you're always going to end up with that imbalance. If you are the person who wants to try and show new games, you, again, either have to bite the bullet and teach the games yourself or find someone else who can. But the biggest thing is getting over that hurdle of thinking, it's my game. It's mine. I bought it. It's mine. <laughs> you have to let it go. You have to find someone. If you know someone who's teaching, it's like, again, like, um, I don't see if there's any reason not to mention them. If Clayton wants to play a game, he gets it shipped to Jamie's house. Like it works for them. And and it's a, it's a really neat relationship. And I think it's kind of awesome. It's like board game polyamory going on there. And I mean, like, it makes sense. And, and, and Clayton's entire game collection is at Jamie's house because they play at Jamie's house because he's got a nice game table and a place to play. But technically Clayton bought the games, but Clayton doesn't have that. It's mine. I need to hold it. I need to hoard it. I need to see my precious thing. He was willing to let that go. And if you're willing to do that, your best bet is if you don't enjoy teaching is to find someone else who does. Absolutely. And no, I'm not saying, Roger, you should ship all your games to me. That wasn't me trying to get, <laughs> get some new games out of them. <laughs> so next, Roger asks, how many times have you been, accused, you been accused of leaving out a rule when you know that player simply forgot and wasn't listening? Now, I will say not often. This hasn't come up that much. But it used to come up more often. And I think it's because I've just gotten better at teaching. Like I have developed skills at teaching games so that this doesn't come up. For one, making sure I know which rules are important, repeating them multiple times, like remember this, remember this, especially something that's often forgotten, literally sitting there and going, okay, here's some rules you're going to forget. Reminding people once you're playing of those important rules you're going to forget. Remember how I said at the beginning in turn four, the economy is going to shift from boats to rivers. Well, it's about to be turn four, so just remember to be aware of that. Um, make sure you're engaging with the players. Uh, again, the biggest trick for engaging someone while, take, while teaching a game is getting them to touch things. Have them draw cards from their decks. Have them put their meeples on the board. Have them roll the dice. Just do keep them engaged. You should have a check for understanding. Like, if someone looks like they're kind of zoned out, question them. Like, say, did you get that? You're going to trade cards? Show me how it works, right? It's it's teaching skills, which I've developed over years. I have been teaching people to play games since the 1980s. I have lots of experience teaching people to play games and people at different skill levels. Now, if someone is completely checking out, confirm they don't want to play. Like, maybe they showed up to game night at the local game store and it ends up that they had a bad day and they thought they were going to get into it. They're just not. Um, see if you actually want to play. and don't be mean about it. Like, do you not want to play? You're not paying attention. More of a, hey, is this not your thing? If this doesn't sound cool to you, you're give, give them a note. Open door policy, right? Like, hey, if you're not interested in playing this, that's fine. We'll find someone else to play or we'll play without you. Like, and, and make it guilt free, right? Not, you're going to ruin this game. We're not going to be able to play, but hey, take a step away. If this doesn't sound interesting to you. And many times just people have other things in the mind. They get distracted. The other thing you may be able to do in this case is present another way to learn. So if it looks like like you're reading the rules and there's no doubt, say, hey, do you want to read it? How about you read this section out loud? Or how about you read this, this section? Or can you summarize this? Or even have another player do it so there's a change in voice. Or again, say, you're obviously not getting this. How about I bring up a watch it play and have everyone watch it on their phones? Because someone at the table is going to have a phone in 2021. I hope someone at your game table has a phone. Or grab a laptop or go, everyone go downstairs to the PlayStation and we'll boot it up YouTube on there. Yeah, and this is also something uh where you're going to play extreme uh and this is one yeah. thing that i don't mind doing and this is this is something that that you know there are times when i know for, personally for me that i will probably forget something and it's not because mm -hmm. i mo hasn't taught it to me it's simply because there are uh, you know in certain games there's a lot of stuff going yeah. on there's a lot of stuff to take in and i'm gonna forget something and you know what oh well I'm probably going to remember it better next time having mm -hmm. been reminded of it when I show up that I have forgotten it during that game. 
And so I don't win the first game. That's fine. I'm probably not yeah. going to win the next six games either. I don't mm -hmm. care. I'm there to have fun. <laughs> if you teach every single rule for a game that we're about to sit down and play, odds are you'll be, you know, we'll be asleep before it's done. <laughs> yeah. You know, there, things will get left out. And when they come up and play, you can handle it then. Uh, unless you're playing with those hyper competitive players who have to know every single rule to, in order to work out the best strategy before. Yes. Those yes. are the ones you hand the rule book. Yep. Here. There, there you go. go. <laughs> here you go. If you're concerned, I missed something, feel free to look it up yourself. And honestly, those players, give them the rule book. Like, like when you're all set and you're done teaching, say, here, you might want to reference this while we're playing. And give it to them. And trust me, they will. They'll be looking up every little play that players do because they're someone who obviously learns better by reading. Um, so the other thing here is something we've mentioned multiple times on the show. Uh, setting expectations, right? You need to make sure everyone knows the first time you are teaching a game, it's not going to be a perfect experience. Someone at the table is going to forget something. Someone's going to try to break the rules and try to do something that's not allowed. Don't get frustrated. Don't get upset. And then there's always the option we always mention that I know very few people take account on. Once you know everyone's got the game, you can always stop and restart at the beginning with everyone with all that knowledge. Absolutely. Test games, play, teaching games. It's okay yes. to not finish a game. Now, getting back to Rogers. After explaining a very complex game, seeing the player's eyes glaze over, you might decide to leave out some of the finer details until a better time to explain. It. You then get flack from the players for hiding information. So, again, you want to get buy in. Do you want to play this game? Are you sure you're going to play this game? All right, are you invested in this? Like, I noticed you're kind of phasing out. Did you catch the last thing I just said? That check for understanding. Again, keep people engaged. Try not to leave things out. Um, like, you know, especially if it's something that is like important to the game where someone's going to be like, well, you didn't tell me those four. Uh, that's a skill, right? Make sure you mention them in passing. Um, when they do call you out for not teaching it, you look to one of the other players and kind of, I taught that, right? Like just get a, so the table knows. So it's not just you and them. Oh, I taught that. You're not. You're just like, I did mention that, right? I apologize. You want to take back your last turn. Because again, teaching game. Remember, be very clear that it's a teaching game. Everyone sitting down to play a game for the first time should realize it's about learning to play the game, not who's going to win. Even if you're highly competitive, that first play should be to explore and find out what happens. Now, if you do have to leave things out, especially in some games where things don't unlock until later in the game, don't even become viable options until turn three, make sure you let everyone know. I am not going to explain this now because it doesn't matter till turn three. I am not going to explain this now because we're in the story part of the game and it won't matter till we get to the adventure part of the game or so on. And then make sure you do remember to mention the stuff when it does happen. Like, we're finishing up turn two. Remember, in turn three, we're going to get to this new phase of the game, and here's what's going to happen. Here's how things change. Then, one of the most important rules that is very difficult for some people to learn, if a player is a jerk, remind them they have no obligation. You have no obligation to teach them the game or keep playing games with them. Yeah, this so much this. As we have often said about relationships, if you're not enjoying a game night with your group, change things. Fix the problem. There's no obligation to keep people around if they are causing problems. Mm -hmm. So back to Roger's question. Seems you just can't win when you're the rule person. Should be the group's responsibility to understand the game, not just one person. Well, again, I disagree about you can't win. If you're the rules person, you teach the game well and people enjoy it, you just won. And that feeling is fantastic and so worth it, to me at least, because I enjoy teaching games. As for being the, the, the group's responsibility, yes, it very much is. Maybe this is all about setting expectations because it is everyone's responsibility to understand the game. Everyone at the table should be working together to make the game as much fun as possible. This will involve things like helping other players out, reminding other players of rule mistakes, asking questions when you're not sure on something. It's not the rule teacher's responsibility to keep the game fun once you start playing. 
It's their job to get the rules across. Everyone then has to work together to understand the game. This could involve looking up stuff in rules. This could involve, as it many times does nowadays, grabbing your phone and going on Board Game Geek to look up a rule question that's not covered in the book. That doesn't have to be one person that does that. It should be a shared thing. And I will say that, yes, it would be awesome if more people shared the teaching responsibility. And a great way to do that goes back to our topic of, excuse me, our topic of picking which, which games to play is that every week a different person should present a game. Well, maybe you rotate who's going to teach it. And again, if you have a group of six and two people are game teachers, maybe the people bring the games the one week and leave it with the other players for a week so that they can teach it the week after. But all of this is about setting expectations. If you're playing at a public play, that's different. If you're going to show up to a public play event and you're showing up to play, show up to play. But if you're showing up expecting to play a specific game, show up with the game expecting to teach it. And it's a bonus if someone else there can teach it for you. But if you're playing with your own home group, it's all about sitting down going, all right, who's going to teach the games? No one. We all hate teaching games. All right. So here's the rule. You do not show up to the game night without knowing how to play the game. However, you figure that out. Download the rule book, get the PDF, watch Rodney Smith, watch uh, Paul Grogan, sit down on Board Game Geek, watch an actual play, go on Twitch and watch the live stream, whatever it takes, you show up here ready to play. And I got to admit, that sounds like an awesome game night to me, but I don't usually plan that far ahead. Yeah, and part of the issue is time and planning. If I go down to Mo's house to play a game, I may not know what game that will be. I, you know, as we talk about, mm -hmm. there is a list of games that need to be played, yes. and we don't do them in order. Uh, and, when if, and when I get there, if we have, say, four hours to play a game, and we want to play Anachrony, mm -hmm. taking an hour to teach myself that game which Mo might already know and be able to speed through the teach of before we can play one that isn't fun for Mo because he may already know the game. And it means we might not even get the game in yeah. because, you know, we're, you know, everyone is sitting around spending the time learning the game instead of working together as a group to learn mm -hmm. it and play. So next, Roger has some ideas on how to improve things. And I got to agree. I, I agree with most of this. So, so maybe players can take turns explaining the game so everyone can see just how hard it is. I, I don't know. I, saying, saying you need to walk in my shoes to me is, is a bit much. It's not, it, different people show up to play games and to game night expecting different things. And you're always going to have those people that are just there to socialize and have fun and don't even care what they're playing. And you're going to have the people who are there that are like, please entertain me. I need a break. I want to play a game. And I'm not, like, it sounds selfish, and I guess in a way it is. But you know what? They probably have lots of responsibilities in the real life they have to deal with. Like, I'm not trying to judge people here by saying it that way. But I think it's perfectly valid to show up the game night saying entertain me. Like, please, you teach me the game. I'm not here to do homework. I'm here to have fun. And learning games and teaching games can be homework. So... What I would try to do is see if there are other game teachers. So as we talked about, find out who the game teachers are and find a way to get the games in their hands ahead of time so that they can be ready for it. Now, we also talked about splitting the game into pieces where each player learns and explains a certain part of the game. I personally think that's best for that. I just opened up the game. The four of us are sitting down. I bought it off the store shelf and we're trying to learn it here. Maybe that is where it gets to something we're going to mention in a second time about multiple rule books because that's one of the problems. So I can kind of see it. But like if you're prepping to show up Saturday night and it's Thursday and you're like, all right, we're all going to take a different section of an act. I just can't see it working. I Maybe it depends on the game. With role-playing games, sure. That's where I would literally say, and this is a rule I have in my role-playing game groups from D&D &D 4E on, is it your character? You better know how it works. That is not my responsibility to know your powers, your abilities, your armor, how your companions work, how your powers work. That's all on you. I got enough to take care of. And I'm going to trust you to not cheat. And then maybe if it's one of those games you're not sure, you might want to audit. But again, you're just checking because players probably made mistakes because it's easy to make mistakes. But that's the way I am. So I could totally see you splitting up there, right? If I'm about to run D&D, &D, it's here's your piece is your character and your piece is your character and my piece is this character. And if you happen to have an animal companion, you better know the animal companion rules. And if you happen to have a familiar, you better have the familiar rules down because I don't care. I want to focus on the story and the bad guys and the stuff that is under my control. For a board game, though, like, like, so you figure out the trading rules for Catan, and I'm going to figure out the resource generation. Like most games work only as a whole. They don't have those individual pieces. So I, I just can't see how to split it up. But I do recommend, again, everyone take their time to 
figure out the game on their own, right? Like, like try to do the due diligence ahead of time. Um, sit there and watch the watch a play, get the PDFs and so on. Yeah, and one of the big things is play raids. Uh, yeah. You cannot go wrong mm -hmm. with player raids because because a good player aid whether that's something that comes with a game and we're seeing a lot of them now a lot yep. of cards coming with games having player aids or something you've downloaded from one of the various sites online uh that a good player aid can turn a teach into an overview yes hey here are the steps of the game for details on those steps look at your player gu mm -hmm. uh, guide Look at that card next to you. Oh, you forget. I'm going to quickly run through what all the turn the turn sequence is. If you forget, check the card next to you. It yeah. makes such a big deal and really that offloads a lot of the cognitive load onto the mm. players and their uh, yes. ends. And one thing to watch, I give them out first. I've seen people teach a game and then be like, oh, and here are some player aids. No, no, give them to the players because they're going to start reading them while you're talking. And then make sure your teach is in the same order as the cards, if you can. Like, like present things in the same order, which, again, I'm, I'm talking a little bit higher level skills here. I, I don't know, higher levels, but, like, just from experience. And if someone is just beating, reading your cards, give them a chance to read them. So don't be like, here are all the player aids. Okay, on turn one, you do this. Like, here are all the player aids. Take a minute to look those over. Give people a chance to look them over. And while they're doing it, set up the board or something. Or again, I've talked about this before. Set up situations so that you can teach the hard parts of the game. Put stuff out. Stack decks. Make it so... Like, watch a Rodney Smith how to play. He's not getting lucky when he flips those cards <laughs> over the deck that match what he's saying, right? You can set that up ahead of time if you've got the time for it. But again, that's all about teaching better, which is not really his question. So the final question he does ask is why is there one set of rules in a game with multiple players? And it's because of that traditional reason that one player generally teaches the game. Now, is it good or bad? I will admit, I don't want to pay more for a game if that's what it takes to put more rule books in there. Because it's a one-time thing. You're only sitting down with one group. You're generally only sitting down once to read the rules. And having four copies of the rules is unnecessary once you've learned the game. You only need one copy to reference once you start playing. It's just like, again, Dungeons and Dragons example. I want four players' handbooks for my four players, probably. I only need one Dungeon Master's Guide. So I can kind of see that. But I have run tons and tons of D&D games with one player's handbook that gets passed around between all the players. You don't... Rule books, honestly, aren't designed to teach games. Good rule books aren't designed to teach games. They're actually designed to be good reference once you start playing. And because of that, you don't need multiple reference manuals. Just like in real life, if, you're, if you've got a computer system, somewhere on the shelf is a reference manual you can grab with the specifics for your robot or your machine or whatever. You don't need a copy for every operator, even if multiple people are operating it at once. So I totally, I, I personally don't complain about there being more than one copy of the rules, but there better be multiple copies of the damn rule summaries and reference cards, because that one drives me nuts. I am perfectly fine with one rule book. One player learns and I'm cool with that or multiple people learn from other sources. But if you're going to put in a reference card that has the turn order or the phases or how to do combat or the exploration flow chart, give me a copy for everyone, please. Or at least, at the very least, one for every two players. Oh, just give me one I, for I every I would prefer player. what It depends <laughs> on the size. Like if it's a technology tree, you probably only need one for every two. But yeah. if, it's the, if it's the actual rules or step, you know, uh, or step steps to the game then yes absolutely you need one per player i find technology charts you can usually pass around pretty easily yeah it's true reference charts um the other thing too um as the chat room's already mentioned but i was going to get to it is nowadays you can find the rules like i don't remember the last time i couldn't find like even old games where you couldn't find a pdf copy of the rule book somewhere on board game geek and 99 percent of the publishers now give them out for free you can find them right on the publisher website. And if not, like I said, go to Board Game Geek. There's also a really good chance you'll find a translated rule book in your language of choice. But here's another little added bonus. We're all Anglophones here. But if you don't speak, if English is not your first language, go find a translation of the rule book. Read that instead of the English one. And then when you teach it, you can teach it in whatever language your group prefers. Now, um, I'm trying to think of someone I know actually goes and gets the French version of rule books. And then teaches in English, but just they can understand the French way better than the English version. 
So that's also something you'll find on Board Game Geek. Um, overall, I don't know. It, it, it can stink, but someone's got to do it. Like, like that's kind of the thing. Someone's going to have to learn to teach the game. Yes, the default is the person who owns the game. The person who brings the game to name night is default the person that's going to have to teach it. But there's no actual reason it has to be. Now, yes, at a public play event where you are showing up to show off this awesome new game you've got, you're probably going to be the one who's going to teach it. But with your own gaming group, this is something that can be worked out ahead of time. As we've mentioned a million times in the show, almost every game night problem we discuss can be fixed with setting expectations. And that's what should be done in this case. Sit down with your group and say, you know what? I don't really enjoy teaching games. Heck, even setting the expectation of, you know what? I don't really enjoy teaching games. And what I hate the most is when you're not paying attention and then you blame me for getting it wrong. I'm doing my best. I'm not the best teacher. You should all realize that. We're all here to have fun. Please be nice to me if I make a mistake, right? Like, like, like be kind. Realize we're all here to have fun, right? That's also setting expectations. And no, I wouldn't be like, well, here you try to teach it. You want to try to avoid those kind of conflicts. I don't think forcing teaching on someone is a good thing. Um, forcing teachers, if they wanted to teach games, they go buy their own games and show up with them. There's probably a reason they're not doing that. So yeah, it can stink. Someone's got to do it. Try to find that someone and make sure the expectations set ahead of time. It's funny. We we're talking about uh, multiple copies of rule books. I still remember, and I think I still have, several games from uh, my family's collection where the rules are on the top of the box. Yes. There is no rule books. The, the yeah. only way to read the rules is, when, is by opening up the box and reading the lid. Yeah, yeah that was definitely the, the, uh, the, 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 how rule books were presented. There weren't yeah. rule books. The instructions that was, that was, of the game very... were on. That was the Chieftain game, Parker Brothers way. Yeah, yeah. Parker Brothers throughout the 70s. That was, your rules were yeah. probably on the box because they didn't want to print out another you know, another piece of paper to include and get lost. It just, it's such a standard thing. Like even sports, how many baseball players have sat down and read the rules of baseball, <laughs> right? There was a teacher, the coach that taught them how to play. It's it yeah. just, it's, and some people make good coaches. Some people make bad coaches. If you don't like being the coach, you find someone else to do it. Like it's kind of the same thing, the way we have. Yep. Well, I think that's it for our talk about the burden placed on the game teaching in tabletop gaming groups remember if you've got a game or game night question for us head over to the website click on ask the bellhop or just email me mo at tabletopbellhop.com 